I'll get you another purple heart for it. Hey! 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 Give us a hand! I got your ride, Doc. How's it going, guys? Welcome back to the channel. Powerful, powerful clip from the hit TV series Band of Brothers. Um, and that's pretty much what we're going to go over today, is um, as a reenactor uh, doing medical... If you were interested in doing uh, uh, medical as far as uh, a surgeon or a, a dental hygienist, uh, even physical therapist, um, I plan on having a couple of those videos coming out soon. But right now we're going to focus on the aid man, or nowadays known as the combat medic. Disclosure. I'm doing an airborne aid man, somebody who's attached to either the 101st or the 82nd Airborne Divisions. Uh, I would like to do a standard ground infantry aid man in the future. First, we're going to start off with the noggin. Huge, huge stereotype is the helmet. So, a lot of people say that, oh, you're a combat medic, so you got the cool red cross on your helmet. Yes and no. Uh, the 82nd Airborne, majority of them, yeah, I'd say majority of the 82nd had red crosses on their helmets. But the 101st, the Screaming Eagles, they did not. Some of them may have, some, but all the photos I've done my extensive research on, they would put white crosses kind of middles, kind of towards the rear of their helmet. So 101st on their helmets would have white crosses. Um, 82nd Airborne, they either had a red cross or they didn't. Period. But you gotta focus that early jumps, or early jump, was Operation Husky in July of 1943. So it was early war for Airborne, but for the war as a whole, it's about mid-war right there, and people's already been hearing war stories about their their brothers in arms in the Pacific getting killed because of that Red Cross. So combat medics, when they jumped into, in this case, Operation Husky was Sicily, so Italy, when they jumped into Sicily, they didn't have any Red Cross in their home. The only symbol they had per Geneva Convention was the arm bazaar on their left arm that was it because they didn't know if they were going to be a target or not they didn't know that if germany or italy or the axis would abide by uh the geneva convention um which later on we find out that they did and that brings me to the next point moving on to the next jump operation overlord which if you've seen the new movie that came out I, if you've seen the next, the new movie that came out, Operation Overlord was surrounded around airborne troops during D-Day. Um, from our little adventures in Sicily, we kind of learned that a lot of medics actually weren't intentionally getting shot at. They were actually being respected as medics, and they, 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 the Germans let them recover the wounded, let them call for the aid men. They came over there, got the leader guys, got the leader boys, sent them to the rear, and got them looked at. 
So a lot of guys started putting uh, red crosses on their helmets. Um, moving on to the next jump, which is probably my favorite of them all, is Operation Market or Operation Market Garden. Um, by now at this point, everybody has red crosses on their helmets. Everybody. Um, it's just because the you know Germany or the it the Axis party in the ETO, the European Theater of Operations. Um, respected the Geneva Convention so much that all the medical personnel were, well, they didn't want to get shot, so they went ham on the Red Crosses. I've seen um, photos of uh, medical personnel with the, med the Red Cross on their uh, medic bags. It's not in the Geneva, you don't really have to have it, but they did because they wanted to be the most visible. I've seen them with, I mean, everybody I've seen, honestly, had two armed brazards on both, on each arm. So they had, or sorry, one brazard per arm. So they had one on the left and one on the right, as well as the marking on their helmet. They wanted to be seen. And Operation Market Garden was um, uh, in Holland. It was the Holland Jump. So, so that's Helmet. Um, now, as from a reenactor standpoint, you don't really have to, if you're going to be a medic, you don't really have to have a mark on your helmet to be considered a medic. If someone comes up to you and be like, you're a medic? Where, where's your red crop? It doesn't have to. I've seen just as many pictures with medics without crosses as medics with them. What well, you don't need, you don't have to. Um, moving on down the body, we got the jacket. Um, early war, early airborne. The most iconic uniform of them all would have to be the M42 jump uniform. Now, this uniform would you would be worn in Operation Husky, uh, in the in the Sicily jump. Um, it's very bleh. Um, it's uh, an OD number three, kind of a, a lot of people say it's khaki, but it's really not khaki, it's olive drab number three, OD number three. Um, it's a little bit darker than a khaki, if, if that makes sense. Um, had, it had four pockets on the, on the jacket itself, um, a zipper, it, it zipped up and down, which is kind of odd for that time. Moving over to Operation Overlord. Uh, which is June 1944. From Operation Husky, we learned real fast, ooh, real fast, that the standard or basic M42s that were being issued to the airborne units were trash, um, which didn't help with Sicily being such a dry, uh, sandier climate that elbows were being rubbed off. Uh, knees being, you know, getting in the nitty gritty, um, were being pretty much sanded off. Like you had holy pants and holy elbows. And not to mention these guys jumped in there with a lot of equipment, a lot of equipment. And they put that equipment wherever they could in their, uh, musette bags. Medical personnel had medical bags. Um, even in their pockets, in, in their breast and lower uh, stomach pockets, they had to. And they blew out, like pocket and all, poof, in the air, bye. So going into Operation Overlord, the riggers regrouped and put together and devised a nice little idea. Why don't we just reinforce the pockets and the elbows and the kneecaps? with canvas. And that's what they did. They they reinforced the uniform completely with canvas. The pocket trim was reinforced with canvas. Um, the elbows were reinforced with canvas. On the trousers, the knees were reinforced with canvas. Kind of like, uh, you know, modern day guys with the knee pads and the elbow pads. This was World War II, elbow and knee pads. This is just canvas. For Operation Market Garden, or the airborne units were pulled back from 
from France and regrouped and pretty much went through a whole pretty much got completely reamped. Um, they did away with the M42 uniform period. The M42 basic, the M42 reinforced, and it's gone. It's out the window. Bye. They got issued brand new M43 combat uniform. Notice I didn't say jump uniform. Um, video for another day, um, I promise. The M43 uniform was um, OD number 7. It, it was not OD3 like its predecessor, the M42s. The M43, the idea behind that was, well, they're kind of moving away from sandy terrain and moving more inland towards Germany. It's a lot of hedgerows, it's a lot of green. So they gave them a greener uniform, the M43. Um, this is the, the jacket right now is really standard issue for any airborne. Okay, it's not just medics. If you are airborne, you got that uniform. Moving down to trousers, it's really the same thing. Uh, for Operation Husky, you got the basic M42, OD number three, kind of a khaki color. For Operation Overlord, June 1944, you got. Uh, the M42s reinforced, not the basic, but the reinforced with the canvas knee pads. And then for Operation Mark Garden in Holland, in Holland of uh, September of 44, you got uh, the M43 trousers. Little tidbit on uh, the M43 trousers, um, that didn't come with the little cargo pockets on the side. That was spe specifically rigged for um, airborne troops. Like I said, standard issue for all airborne units. It's if you were uh, mechanized or MP or medical, it didn't matter, you had that uniform. Um, moving on down, you got uh, your boots. So Operation Husky and Overlord, you wore the same pair, you, you wore the same pair of boots. Corcoran jump boots. They were usually like a light, kind of a darker brown leather. Um, I got a pair of hands. Pork room jump boot. What I don't have a pair of though, sadly, is going into Operation Market Garden. Like I said, they got a complete overhaul. They got, they got re -amped. Um, it's no longer, uh, Corcoran jump boots, which they were worn, they were worn, but a lot of people, when they saw these shoes, they went with those. They were called the double buckles, which were kind of like, it's kind of like the Corcoran. It had the ankle support. The only thing it was though, it, 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 it was like a service shoe kind of way with like leather added to it. And it, you still laced it up. The only difference is it had two buckles, one here, one there, and you buckled it to your ankle. That's boots. Um, moving on to gear. Okay, so this is where it gets a little tricky, okay? Um, hmm. Okay, so combatant PIR, Parachute Infantry Regiment. Um, if they carried a Grand, they'd probably have a Grand cartridge belt with all their webbing attached to it. If they carried a car a carbine, they would probably would have had a had an M1 carbine uh, cartridge belt. Medics were a little bit more modular, which I mean, if you think about it, you kind of wanted them to be. They had a pistol belt, okay, as kind of the base of their web gear. Um, rather than a cartridge belt with its integrated pouches, it was just a belt. Um, and with that, um, you would have your suspenders. Now, here's where y'all get to do y'all's own digging. Um, in my opinion, airborne, okay? Airborne combat medics 
wore the M36 combat suspenders. The same suspenders that their buddies with a Garand next to them is wearing. A combative suspenders. The reason I say that is because medics were issued the yoke suspenders. Which, if you watch Hacksaw Ridge, he's wearing yoke suspenders. Of course, uh, he, in Hacksaw Ridge, he was infantry, like ground infantry. So yeah, they would have worn medic yokes, no, no doubt about it. Key note, if you go on Google Images and you type in combat medic World War II, and you see a doll that some guy has put together and made, and it looks good, I guess. He's talented. And he's wearing yokes. Don't be taking photos of that and sending it to me saying, but he's wearing yokes. It's a doll. It's totally a doll made by man. Man makes mistakes. Man aren't perfect. Medic bags. One of the most unique, other than the helmet on the Red Cross, um, is the medic bags. Medic bags being, like so, has these kind of D-rings on the sides that you would attach to, um, your suspender of choice, I guess. Um, you don't even have to attach them to your suspenders. Um, you can totally attach it to, uh, just a normal, just a normal sling. I've seen photos of them slung behind their back across with a normal, kind of like a satchel sling, uh, sling. It does not have to be attached to your suspenders. Um, one thing though, and most of my research I found, was that jump medics, airborne medics, really only carried one. Mainly because it's a lot of weight. Yeah, I mean this I have it filled to the to the brim of supplies, which I will open up and show you. But it's light because none of it's filled. None of the boxes in this is filled. I guarantee you once I fill this, which will be in the upcoming weeks, this bag will be heavy. Really heavy. Times that by two, or three, or four, or five. So I can understand why they only pack one. Plus, you got their pockets and your musette bag, which leads me to the next point. I'll set this down. We're gonna get her to open that musette bag. Musette bag was also standard issue for every airborne troop. Musette bag was your life. It had um, your K rations in it, um, which were early early MREs, if you will, for airborne troops. Um, it had your K rations. It had. Uh, your eating utensils, it had, if you brought uh, let down rope, you would have your let down rope in it, uh, um, extra medical supplies for medical supplies. Um, troops were giving uh, tents, but that's the type of stuff you'd have in your new setback. E-tool. Uh, medics did carry e-tools. Um, you know, it, it, could be, it could be dark, you could be in be in the Ardennes forest and it's dark and no one's ever going to see a red cross in your helmet nor on your arms. You, you, they're not going to see it. But if it's a night raid and they start pouring into you, if you don't have a foxhole dug, you better be relying on that little little pine tree right there because you, you want a foxhole. And you're not going to go up to your battle buddy and be like, hey man, let me get that shovel because he's going to be using it. Everybody. Everybody, everybody had an e-tool. Usually consisted of a shovel, a T-handle shovel. Um, you would have two canteens, uh, one for you, or kind of both for you in a way, if, if you're thirsty and one's empty, and you can go right ahead. But really the idea is because you're, you're medical, a lot of fluids will be drained. Either it's blood or hydration. Uh, you're gonna need to re replenish those fluids. Um, so you would have a minimum of two canteens, minimum. Um, really, one for you, one for a patient of so, so of sorts. Um, 
you would have a first aid pouch. This is going to be for you. This is your first aid pouch. This isn't something you pull out and give to somebody else. No. No, no, no. This is your first aid pouch. If you were hit, you would then go to your first aid pouch, which is um, a Carlisle bandage kit. Um, you'd have a pouch on your front left. Front right or left, forgive me. Um, you'd pull, you'd pull the, the can, it's like a little tin can, and it's kind of like a can of sardines. It has a key in you. You open it all around, and you open it, and you get, I believe it's a sulfonide uh, packet, um, a Carlisle bandage. Um, I think that's it. I think the later war had uh, morphine serrettes, I believe. So that's your pretty much your web gear, um, and that's your basic kit. Now, oh, I'm going to go over a little little things right here. A lot of people say, I'm going to do combat medic because it's cheaper. <laughs> you know, um, I get it. You're a non-combatant. You don't have to buy a Grand or a Carbine or a Thompson. I get it. I get it. I see why you think it's more cheaper. But the, um, the money you can put towards a grand depends on how serious you want to take your role as a combat medic. Um, I've spent a lot of money, you know. Everybody in the uniform buys their gear in uniform. That price stays the same for, for a medic or anybody. Because the uniform, everybody's wearing it. Where it differs is the extra goodies you, how serious you want to take it. Uh, I don't know, for, I don't know, 505th, 82nd, if you want to go all out, you're going to buy, you know, if you're doing a Battle of the Bulge Press, you're going to get a great coat. You don't need it, but it's, it adds to the impression, it adds to the reality. Um, you're going to buy a great coat, you're going to buy, um, a Mandalore full of ammo, you're gonna buy um, a helmet net, you're gonna buy medic airborne medic pouches tied to the net, you're all this fun little stuff, just just icing on top. But you don't need icing to make a cake. Let me show you this. This is some pretty cool stuff. So this is the medic bag. Um this came all the way from France. Sweet lady by the name of Poppy, she makes all this reproductions herself, and it's phenomenal. Yeah, okay, they're not filled, but, I mean, I don't think she's really licensed to be selling and distributing morphine syrettes. So, and they do sell uh, morphine, the actual syrette, on um, eBay, Amazon, uh, some other sources. You, you could you can actually fill these boxes, but the morphine syrette itself is is literally air. It, it's like a beef jerky. Okay, it's full of air. Um, you squeeze it, nothing's gonna happen. And the needle end is also kind of bowed at an O, and you kind of, like you. So if you go to stab somebody, it's gonna tickle rather than hurt. She made me some morphine boxes. I believe these hold, are supposed to hold five. Yep, five syrettes. So cool. It even says poison, because pure mor morphine by itself is a poison. Adhesive tape. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. And this is the stuff I was telling you that I does, I do, I bleh. I do know that does come in a Carlisle tin for your personal first aid kit. Sulfamonide packets. Now this is where I go for, um... When, when, little Jimmy over there, he, he took one in the leg. I'll go over there and assess. I'll look. I'll make sure, oh my god, he's bleeding a lot. Or, okay, you're good, it's just a little flesh wound. I will then take, uh, my, my scissors, my scissors, and cut off the uniform. We're reenactors. <laughs> These uniforms aren't cheap. So, don't be going on top of some poor guy. With your, with, with your scissors and start cutting his uniform off. It would be cool though if you get close to the spectators and y'all mutually agree on that. Oh, that A plus, man. That's awesome. Because that's really what happened. These guys, what I just went over, 
was the basic uniform to get you guys started in the hobby. These guys actually wore like four, three layers minimum. A t-shirt, underwear, their wools, as well as their combat uniform. Later war, if you go into Battle of the Bulge, and that's December, the majority of that was spent in the snow. That's where you're going to get more layers. You got to cut through all that stuff. Well, anyway. When you get to the wound, and it's a bare wound, you take this, uh, and you sprinkle some of this on it. kind of, kind of, uh, sterilizes the wound a little. But, as a combat medic, you're not there to fix him, so to speak. If that makes sense. You're only there to patch him up, get him stabilized, and send him to the rear. So he can be thoroughly assessed, and brought to a field hospital, where he can actually get fixed. You are supposed to put this on the wound, rub it in, and take some form of bandage. In this case, I had just, it was first thing on the top, a gauze bandage. This is two inch by six yards. So kind of a thin bandage, but super long, six yards. And she gave me, she, she gave me a lot of that stuff. Here, if I can see it, okay. There's your small first aid dressing. You look on the uh, top left, it says Carl, bleh, Carlisle model. This would be found in your medical tent. Minus the box though. The box would be with in our medical bags. The uh, tin would be loose because the tin's enough protective packaging as it is. Here's another one. Same thing, it's a Carlisle model bandage. Um, it's called Carlisle because it was, uh, it was made, manufactured, and designed at, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Favorite piece that Some Poppy Reproductions does. Some Poppy Reproductions. Anyway, anyway, so I got a tag book. If you're gonna be a combat medic, period, you gotta have a tag book. Like, how this would work, we'll, we'll go back to little Jimmy. Little Jimmy's chilling in his foxhole, next thing you know, he takes one in the leg. So I run over there, I assess it, I cut open uh, his pants legs, and I see the wound. It's 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 not that bad, just a flesh wound. I'll take my, 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 my sulfamonide and I'll sprinkle it on, kind of rub it in a little bit. Um, I would then take, Take, um, you don't really use, I'll take about two or three of uh, my, my two by six gauze bandages, wrap the wound, make it, get it nice and sterile, and then you don't really have to ask him these questions. If he's, if he's, if he's able to speak to you and he's not in a lot of pain, you can. Um, but all this stuff you can find on his person, grade, his company, regiment, and arm of or service, division, his corpse, army, age, race, um, service years, so right here it says diagnose, if injury, state how, when, where occurred, so I would take my pencil and I'd write down, little Jimmy was shot out of his foxhole at the crossroads, nothing serious, just a flesh wound, bullet still inside um, and then right down below that it says treatment that's when I'm gonna say uh, gave little Jimmy sulfamonide packet on wound dressed with gauze if he's screaming and hollering and he is in pain I will go for a morphine syrup if not if you don't have to give him one don't don't but in this case, he screamed and hollering, I gave him a morphine. One. No more. Just one morphine. And I'll write down under the treatment, in all caps, make it known, I gave him one morphine. This stuff's a drug. Not only is it addictive, it can kill. So I'd write that down below treatment, and I would take it, and right here, there's holes inside the paper. I'd take it, 
and you're supposed to have a paper, uh, little string down. I haven't got around to it yet, but I take it, I tie it to little Jimmy somewhere or another, call for a, um, a leader man, a leader boy. He's going to come with a stretcher like it's a leader. And we're going to pick him up, put him on it, and take him back to the uh, aid station. Hopefully, little Jimmy will turn out. Um, medicine back then actually was really good. It's not like the Civil War. Little Jimmy leg probably wouldn't be amputated. It was a Civil War. Isn't that a fix to everything? Cool thing, you can never have enough of these. You can never have enough safety pins. And the cool part about it, this is exactly how they would be packaged and given to the troops. She, some Poppy Productions killed it with this stuff. Absolutely killed it. Iodine swabs. Another form of disinfectant. If you've ever, if you're watching this and you've ever given blood, they they scrubbed iodine on you. It, it's this brownish kind of yellowish stuff that it stains. To be honest, it stains, but it's so good. It works so well. And this is ten iodine swabs. Um, Bower and Black. There's iodine swabs. We have ammonia inhalants. Contains ammonium hydroxide, ammonium carbonate, and 35% alcohol. And this is pretty cool. And then on the back, she even put like the instructions. That's pretty cool. It's another iodine swab box. Kind of different, especially the back. Poison, antidote, give starch or flour with water, call a position, directions, crush the ampule between the thumb and fingers. Paint the wound and skin around with iodine. Allow iodine to dry thoroughly. Apply dry gauze dressing loosely over the wound. Never use iodine with a wet dressing or near eyes. Only use once and as soon as possible after injury. Some good stuff. Ooh, ooh. I want to do a video on these. So, these are called triangular bandages. And it gives you one on the back. It gives you one idea how to use it. But I'm going to let you know now. Triangle, triangular bandages were very popular for really one many reasons. They're very modular. You can take, like you see, you can do that into a sling. If you got hit in the arm, you need it, you need it raised above the heart. You, you can do it in a sling. There's ways you fold it. You can Google search it and find it. I'm telling you, there's so many folds you can do with a triangular bandage. Sorry for the video being this long, guys. Um, had a lot to go over. If you are interested in joining um, your a unit, most units will have loaner gear. If not, you know, try to work with them. Um, uh, get your uniform as soon as possible. This stuff, you you do not. It's not a necessity. You don't have to have it to do an impression. Um, it's just I met this girl uh, uh, through a, a buddy of mine, and and. She does it pretty much for a living, and she she nails it. Um, she will be um, in the description. Uh, you can find her Etsy. Uh, she's on Facebook. I'll, I'll put it all in the description, please, guys. If you were wanting to do combat medic, not telling you now, but eventually, get this stuff. They're great display items. You kind of throw out a, a a wool blanket and have this kind of sitting there with your medic bag. Great display item if you are doing tacticals, if your unit is a combatant reenacting group and they do go out and burn some blanks. Definitely put stuff some of these with you can use um uh modern day dressings and just kind of stuff them in there. Uh, I won't know the difference. You just pull out the packaging, um open it, dress the wound. It, I don't know how big the event would be, but you could, let, hey, 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 you know, bring a stretcher and put them on it and send them to the rear. It's, they're great. I love them. And like I said, not a necessity. All right, guys, uh, this is the end of the video. Um, if I missed anything, please comment down below. Please, please, please. I will take your criticism. Um, 
if you'd like to see something else, uh, World War II, I don't care if it's German, Japanese, I don't care. I don't care. Comment it down below. I'll do some research. And who knows, I might be able to get some guests on this channel. Um, that, <laughs> frankly, know more about it than I do. Um, but medical is kind of up my alley. I, I can handle this video by myself. Um, if y'all want to see more, stay tuned. See you.